It is so good to see each and every one of you with us here today as we come together to worship our Heavenly Father. I trust that we've all come together this day for that purpose. As was mentioned earlier, we do have those who are visiting here with us. We want you to know that you are a welcome guest, and we invite you to come back at any opportunity that you may have. If we say something that prompts a question, or maybe you see something that you have a question about, don't hesitate to come up afterwards and, and ask that question of us, and give us a chance to answer it, to study with you from the Word of God. I would like for you this, e for this afternoon's lesson, if you have time this afternoon, read Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. We're going to be looking at that in a part of tonight's lesson entitled, entitled, The Dangers of Being a False Prophet. So we'll look at that this evening, The Dangers of Being a False Prophet. And part of that text will come from Jeremiah chapter 23. Three, beginning in verse 9, roughly, and reading through the end of the chapter. This morning, though, we're going to talk about something of a little bit more simpler of a nature. I think one of the greatest challenges of owning clothing is keeping them clean. Even the Lord told the children of Israel, before he came to the mountain, he gave them three days to prepare, and one of the things that they were to do were to wash their clothes. Now, I think we probably wash our clothes a little more, free, more frequently than they did. And we are so meticulous about having our clothes clean that you can buy these nice little tidy sticks that'll get that spaghetti stain just right out of there, typically. But it's the idea of being washed, being clean. If you're going to go out in public, you don't want to go out looking all dirty and filthy. You want to go out looking clean. Many people are walking in the world today not being physically dirty, but being filled with sin and with the stain of sin. And what I'd like to do this morning for a few minutes is look at the idea as taught within the Bible about being washed away. More to the point of having our sins and our iniquity washed away by the blood of the Lamb. Truly, sin is the great separator between God and man. You'll notice in your Bibles over in Isaiah chapter chapter 59, verses 1 through 2, Isaiah reminds the children of Israel what had separated them from God. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1, he says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. And truly, sin has separated man from God. All the way back to why Adam and Eve were cast from the Garden of Eden and from that presence of God. Sin, a stain and a blight upon man. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, John even acknowledges that it is that sin which separates us from the fellowship of God if we truly walk in that darkness. Notice in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, he says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth, claiming a fellowship that doesn't exist because we're walking in darkness. The same claim that Israel may have made on a few occasions, but it was a false claim because their iniquities have separated them from God. Now the thing with any stain is that you want it to be removed. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we'll read this here in a little bit later, Paul reminds the brethren in Corinth, but you were washed. When you study the history of the Bible, it is all about removing the stain of sin, removing that which would separate us from God. Consider as a great example, we mentioned Isaiah's writing earlier. Turn with me now to Isaiah chapter 1. And Isaiah begin his, begins this particular writing addressing that which separated Israel from God. Come down in Isaiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. He says, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. 
Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Now oftentimes we will use that verse in a song that we sing in reference to our sins. But in the specific context here, he was pleading with Israel to wash, to be cleansed, to remove that which was separating them from God by turning back to God. We see a similar type prayer prayed by David in Isaiah chapter 51, or Psalms chapter 51. After David's sin with Bathsheba, he finally, roughly nine months later, comes to the full admission of what he had done and the willingness to accept the responsibility for it and pray to God. And in Psalms 51, beginning in verse 1, as we read earlier in our scripture reading, he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitudes of your tender mercy. Now note this, he prays to God, Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. David prayed to the Lord that he might be cleansed, that, he may be, that his iniquities might be washed from him. He says in verse 3, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Then he says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. David recognized and understood the importance of being cleansed, of having all of his sins, in this case in point, the ones pertaining to his sin with Bathsheba, washed away, removed by God. When we come forward into the New Testament, we see the same thing being taught. But now the washing away is now made possible by the death of Christ upon the cross of Calvary. Notice the words of Ananias in Acts chapter 22 verse 16 when Paul, in recounting the instant of his or the account of his conversion, he says in Acts 22 verse 16 that Ananias came up to him. And he said, why, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The problem with sin is that it is a stain and it separates from us from God. It must be washed away. Not temporarily removed, not painted over so that it's not seen but completely and utterly removed. That's why Paul writes to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. He says, but you have been washed, but you have been sanctified, but you have been justified. It's all about the removal of the guilt of sin from our lives. The thing is, though, it is much more than simply saying, okay, I'm ready to be baptized, we put you under the water and come back up, and then you walk away. There's more to it than simply water. Let me illustrate what I mean by this. Turn back to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, and let me recall to your mind the account of Noah and his family. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, Peter reminds the recipients of the letter he says, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Now think about this, and we've talked about it before. The water that killed millions of people saved eight people. And someone says, well, how could that be? How could be the water that, saved, that destroyed millions of people save eight? It's because eight people did what God told them to do and built an ark. And when the flood waters came, it lifted the ark up. And hence the people were saved through water. But it wasn't about the water. It was about their obedience unto God. Remember the story of King Naaman in 2 Kings? When you turn back over in our Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 5, and we start there beginning in verse 19, here we have a man who's stricken with leprosy. And he heard that there was this man down in, uh, down in Israel who might be able to heal him. 
So he goes down there and he learns of this man by the name of Elisha. So he goes up to Elisha there and he petitions Elisha so that he might be healed. In 2 Kings chapter 5, starting in verse 9, he went with his horses and chariot, Naaman did, stood at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. All you have to do, there's no dancing, there's no charge, there's no jumping up and down, there's no twirling, there's no trick. Just go to the river Jordan and dip seven times. Well, King Naaman, was, this was not what he was wanting to hear. Verse 11, he became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. And then he said, And are not the Abana and the far part, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Just thought, well, this is ridiculous. I mean, we have better rivers over there in Damascus that I could go dip in. They're by far much cleaner. They don't have these Jewish people down here washing in them. That might have been his mindset. But notice, his servant came near and spoke to him in verse 13 and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? He says, How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Was it because of the miraculous healing properties of the Jordan River? No, it was because he obeyed God. God said it, he did it, and he obeyed. Let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. Remember in the days of Noah, how the eight saves were saved by water? Peter then says, in 1 Peter 3, verses 20 and 21, he says, In the like manner whereunto even baptism doth also now save you. What do you mean by that, Peter? Well, think about the days of Noah. Eight souls were saved by water. He says, Now in the similar fashion, or in the like manner whereunto even baptism doth also now save you. Why? He says, It's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's not about the water. It's an answer of a good conscience for you are towards God. The point is that God says do it, so you do it. Whether it's in a drum of water, or in a fiberglass baptistry, or it's in a river, it doesn't matter. If you obey the command of Christ to believe and to be baptized, you will be saved, your sins will be washed away because you obeyed God. Just as Noah and his family were saved because they obeyed God, just as Naaman was saved or he was cleansed because he obeyed God, so too will your sins be washed away if you will obey God today and believe that Christ is the Son of God and be baptized. For those of you who have not yet become a child of God, the question I guess I have for you is why not? Why have you not taken the opportunity? Have you heard enough to believe? Have you heard enough of his word to be convicted that his word is true and that Jesus is the Son of God and that there's sin within your life which needs to be washed away? If so, then let's make the change. Remember what, Jesus, what Paul, John says about Peter, about Jesus in 1 John 1, 7? He says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If you're not a Christian, the blood of Jesus Christ stands ready to forgive you or to make possible the forgiveness of your sins, the washing away of your sins by the blood of the Lamb. Where are you standing right now? Are you lost in sin? If so, then let's come to Christ. Let's come to his word. Let us appeal to God for help and find that answer only within his wonderful word. Jesus told his apostles that they would go preach the gospel to all creatures. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. That salvation comes because God washes your sins away when you obey his call into salvation. If you're not a Christian, you need to become one. Let's not wait any longer. If you are a Christian and you've been walking in sin, why? Consider the price that was paid for you and come back to where you once were by repenting and returning to God. If you're subject to the gospel's call and invitation, come forward now as we stand and as we sing.